All right, check, check, check. Sorry, check, 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 check. Check's good. All right, this is the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast. My name is Nick. Um, it is, I probably should have checked this before I started. <laughs> it's April 15th. Um, yeah, it's April 15th. 5.46 a.m., in case you're wondering, 46 minutes late. Sorry, I had to run to the gas station and get a Red Bull and a chicken sandwich. Um, which is going to sit really well with me when I get done with this and then try to go run on the trail. Um, th- what episode is this? Somebody help me out here. 41? No, this is 40. Oh my God. What episode is this? I don't know if I've ever not known. <laughs> I wish there was some music that I could play right now while I go. <laughs> Open my, open my phone, go to blueberry.com, look at my directory listing. This is episode 41. All right, fair enough. Episode 41, um, and I'm going to try to do this thing here that I've been saying now for two episodes we're going to do. But let's talk about the obvious first. Actually, it's not that obvious, is it? It wasn't that obvious a few weeks ago when I feel like we here, <laughs> the collective, the royal... We here, at the, the, me and my entire staff, you know, all of us at the 40 on Hemlock podcast were the first to point out, oh, really? Okay, we weren't the first. Probably couldn't have been the first, right? But made this point kind of on at the beginning of this most recent uh, string of episodes before which there was a, a yawning, a yawning gap in the, the output of this podcast. Um what did we say, like, episode 36 or 37? We're like, look, this is weird, right? Because people keep telling you, oh, this thing's so dangerous because the fatality rate is, you know, X percent. You know, it's like 3 4 percent. That, that's pretty bad. You know, you get something, you got three out of three or four out of 100 chance, chances to die, right? Sounds pretty bad. And then and we, and we pointed out, this is really weird because they say that and then they turn around and say, oh, but it's and it's, and it's much more widespread than we currently believe because the testing's so inadequate, right? Well, they, they can't both be true. They're probably, I, I guess they could both be true, but they're probably not both true, right? It stands to reason that if the thing's way more widespread, then we would know if all that many more people were dying, right? So you can't have it both ways. If the thing's way more widespread, then the denominator of the fraction representing the mortality rate is larger. And if the denominator of the fraction representing the mortality rate is larger, well, then the thing is less dangerous than we've been supposedly. Now the question becomes how much less dangerous. All right. So that was a few weeks ago. We, we, you know, we popped that off and then lo and behold, a couple weeks later, one of my, one of my favorites, I won't, I won't say who on the radio was like, that was the first one to say this. <laughs> like, I'm like, whatever. Yeah. He, yeah. he was because no one's listening to my show. Um, but we were. Okay, so there's some more interesting stuff here in the numbers, I think. Um, and I want to do this before we get on to, uh, what are we doing today? Oh, yes, the science writer. This is important. There's some more interesting stuff in the numbers, and I'm not going to wonk out on the numbers because, honestly, I was going to do this show two days ago, and I, I jotted down all the numbers and the math <laughs> at that point. <laughs> And, you know, this thing moves so fast that now my numbers are obsolete. So I'm not going to wonk out on the numbers. Um, But incidentally, it moving fast is part of the point. Remember, we pointed out to you that the news is constantly making it sound like there is this inferno, right? Like this wildfire of a virus that is spreading through the population at this just insane rate. So like they come on one day and they're like 10,000 new cases today. Right. And you're like, Oh sh- shit. <laughs> you know, right? All right. And we pointed out that this is misleading. This is what the writers, the journalists do to prod you and move you, which we will talk more about in a little bit because that is relevant to the topic of the show. Right. You got to look at a number like that when they're like this many new cases today and realize that what they're saying, what they ought to be saying is we've discovered that there are this many cases today, not this many new cases 
were created or spread or th- there were this many new infections. See, see the difference? In fact, oftentimes they would say, and they do say, X number of new infections yesterday, right? You don't know that, dude. They don't know that. And it is misleading to talk that way. There's a difference between talking about our discovery of X number of infections versus the actual rate of spread of X number of infections. And again, this is something we all should have been cognizant of, right? Because at this, uh, to go back to the previous point, at the same time that they were telling us, this thing is so fatal. What else were they telling us? Oh, and it's probably way more widespread than we even thought, right? Well, if that's true, then it has already spread, right? And if it has already spread, then that denominator is really big or bigger than it is heretofore supposed. And if it's really big, then let's revise the fatality rate and stop scaring the shit out of people. And now they're starting to do that. The honest ones. Ah, here comes the heater. Sorry. I'm in the basement. Here comes the heater. Um, And it can't come soon enough. So... What are the numbers? In the world, it's like fatality rates at like 6.3% right now. In the U.S., fatality rates like 4.2%, right? Or the fatality rate as they would have you conceive of it, which we pointed out one or two shows ago in our little told you so episode. That's not the fatality rate at all because that takes what? That takes the number of fatalities and places it as the numerator over what denominator? The number of people tested who have the virus. So we have those who have died of it over those who have it but have not died. And that fraction, supposedly, wrongly, represents the fatality rate. Well, no, it doesn't. Because what that neglects, right, are all the people out there who have had it or do have it and haven't come in for a test. And depending on how many more of those are out there, than is currently represented by the have tested and tested positive category, right? Then the fatality rate is correspondingly that much smaller because that number is going to jack up that denominator of that fraction. So we've been saying this, right? Sorry, I'm not trying to be all, listen to my show because I'm, it's not like that. It's just this kind of stuff, man. This, you know, I, my shtick on this show is all like, listen, you have to understand that you have to be vigilant against all these voices that are arrayed out there in society, in the media, telling you what to think and who to fear and what to worry about. You have to, you have to, you have to be vigilant because you, a lot of them, most of them, most all of them are aimed squarely against you, posturing as advocating for you. Okay. And that's we're going to talk a bit. We're going to talk more about this tonight. With this, or tonight, yeah, I used to do this show at night. Talk more about now. It's five in the morning. Right? Talk more about this when we talk in a minute about the science writer. It's very important. But you got to be vigilant against these folks because they are they are ringing alarms and they have ulterior motives. And of course, it's it's becoming clear now what the motive is, right? Because this is like the last hurrah. This is the last attempt to just completely futilely upend, unearth, eradicate the Trump presidency, you know, everything else, nothing else worked. Now they're going to just, they're going to sink on this ship as well, you know, and Captain whatever, the mutiny on the bounty, (laughs) Captain whatever is going to come out victorious. Um, I didn't read the book. So here, I said a moment ago, there's, there's a couple other things that are interesting in the numbers. Um, well, we're getting a little bit of a picture now. Remember I quoted that, that Stanford, uh, those Stanford scientists who are like, hey, guess what? We've been thinking of fatality rate, or the media has been construing the fatality rate incorrectly. Here's how we, it should be properly construed. And we were like, ding, 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 told you so. Well, guess what else? There's some more anecdotal stuff coming out that um, corroborates this in a way. So there's this uh, nurse in Chicago who was interviewed who was like, oh yeah, easily, listen to this, easily, 
30 to 50 percent listen to this 30 to 50 percent of those coming through my line for coronavirus testing have antibodies to the virus now i'm no medical doctor but i can tell you that what that means is that you had it but don't have it anymore that's the only way you get antibodies to something is if you get something your body starts fighting it off builds up antibodies it vanquishes it and then you got those antibodies that's sort of like the evidence it's sort of like your uh uh, it's like the the T-shirt that you get from the bar when you're like you're like I closed Smitty's, you know. It's like the antibodies are your proof that you were there, man. All right. I don't know Smitty's is a bar or something. All right. So she says, listen now for the import of this, for the importance of this. It says thirty to fifty percent of those coming through my line have antibodies, and about ten to twenty percent will just. We'll just rest easy in the middle at 15. We'll say 15%. But 10 to 20%, she says, test positive. Why is that important? Well, think about what's being said. 10 to 20% test positive. What do we know about test positive as a category? That's what everybody's been using as the denominator of the fatality rate fraction. What's wrong with that? Go back and listen to previous shows if you want to know what's wrong with that. But now we're getting a picture of just what we ought to be doing or at a minimum what we can be doing with this denominator, right? Because what do we know now? We know that 30 to 50% have antibodies. Why is that important? That means they had it but don't. Why is that important? Because that represents a group that has had the disease but did not die by it you see now we have a concrete addition to that denominator we have a a factor by which we can increase we know that not only do we have this 10 percent test positive versus however many on top already the numerator died and there we we get our, our fatality rate our mortality rate we know about that bottom the adjustment we need to make to the bottom number that 30 to 50 percent of the people getting tested test negative not because they don't have it because they did have it why is that distinction important it's important because they're not susceptible to death by it if they don't have it anymore and that numerator can't touch them see what's happening here this fatality rate that they've been describing to us is woefully off because I'm giving you like a concrete, a concrete adjustment that you can make to that, to, to that denominator. If you want to work out the fractions, my little daughter's doing homeschooling right now, all our math stuff, we're doing fractions, right? So big on the fractions right now. All right. I can find <laughs> the greatest common denominator and convert fractions. Me and my daughter, we got it. Um, so now here's what else extrapolate those numbers out into the untested population. See, it's not just 30, 30 to 50 percent that we've been neglecting because they test negative, but the, but our reason for seeing that they test negative has not been complete. Now we know, oh, they're testing negative because the antibodies. So they had it. So they're not potential carriers. That number, in other words, whatever that numerator grows to. It can't grow into that swab, swath, swatch, cross-section of people. Do you see? They're off limits. The angel of death shall pass over their house. Yikes, was that heavy-handed? All right. So that's a concrete consideration for adjusting that number substantially. And now here's a a concrete, but a little less concrete, but still relevant and important. That 30 to 50 percent, we have we have a swatch, a swath, whatever you want to call it, a a piece of the pie on our little colorful Microsoft Word pie chart. Right. We got a piece of the pie that we should call untested population. Now, we can make some assumptions about that untested population. What's one of the assumptions that we can make about that untested population? Well, Whatever we found in the tested population, right, as far as that 30 30 to 50%, it's going to be represented in that untested too. Some section 
of that big old piece of pie that's called untested, right? Is gonna is gonna get sucked up. <laughs> Sorry about this is not technical terminology here, right? Is gonna be also antibody carriers or antibody havers, right? Which means they have had it, don't anymore, and thereby, therefore, they're not going to die by it. Which means, correspondingly, the fatality rate goes down. Isn't this interesting? I just want to say I'm not... Look, <laughs> I don't want to turn this into like where like, like I do like the, the host jocular, like listen to me because everybody else is wrong. I, I just, you know... <laughs> Just saying. A few weeks ago. It's just a hunch, right? We just sort of explored it a few weeks ago, and then it started the, the echo the, it started to happen in the media. Now, now more is coming out. And you got to wonder, how much has this thing been overblown? Because what we're telling you here, we are measuring the overblownedness of this thing, right? And we're getting a feel for it. It's still an elephant in a dark room, right? But it's an elephant. What else have we read? 90% of those... Now, this is a different kind of consideration. Here's a different kind of analytic. Here's a different kind of metric. But nonetheless, 90% of those fatalities, roughly, 9 out of 10 have been in cases where there is a serious underlying condition. What does that mean? It means that not only is the mortality rate been overblown in quantity, it has been overblown in quality. All right, what is going on here? Why is my fucking gym closed? I want to go work out. <laughs> oh, I'm not making light. People are dying. That is not the point. It's not whether or not people are dying. People are dying every day. I might die tomorrow. You might die tomorrow. The question is, what are we dying of? And is that thing that we're dying of correctly conceived of as the threat to the society at large that it has been made out to seem as? And for what purpose has it been made to seem that way? Study. Coronavirus fatality rate lower than expected. Close to the flu's point one percent in other words one out of a thousand rather than three out of a hundred one out of a thousand the fatal and highly contagious coronavirus has spread faster but is less deadly than official data imply the economist magazine reported over the weekend citing a new study you see spread faster and is less fatal and both of those things corroborate one another because since the beginning, we've been pointing out that these folks are like, oh, it's so fatal, but it's probably way more prevalent out there than we thought, right? And we're like, hey, that doesn't make any sense because if it's way more prevalent, then it's actually less fatal because we know how many people have died, right? And we also said that they've been confusing purposefully this distinction between new cases discovered in a day versus new cases, like new infections, actually a current in a day, right? It all makes sense. On Saturday, The Economist reported that the fact that the illness caused by the coronavirus has spread across the United States could be good news. Well, yeah, I've been saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop saying that. I'm going to stop saying I've been saying that, all right? Because I don't want to be like that, but man, I <sighs> quote, if millions of people were infected weeks ago without dying, <clears throat> can I say it one more time? If millions of people were infected weeks ago without dying, the virus must be less deadly than official data suggests, the magazine determined. Correction, the 40 ounce hemlock podcast determined like four weeks ago. Using graphs to suggest the faster the disease spreads and hits its peak, the fewer people will die. Yup. 
article goes on. The Economist article cited a new study by Justin Silverman and Alex Washburn that used data on influenza-like illness to show the coronavirus is now widespread in America. And we have evidence that that is in fact the case. Namely, that Chicago nurse saying, yeah, 30 to 50% of the people I test, they got the antibodies. And again, we have testing that is just now moved out of the, or you could argue is still arguably in the, I'm coming in because I think I might be sick phase. It's, ju- it's either still in that phase or just moving out of it, right? So we still don't have an accurate sample. So those numbers will only be revised up. That 30 to 50% of people with antibodies, I guarantee that's going up. Why? For the same reason that the other ones are, because the testing is getting more prevalent now. We're getting an increasingly accurate conception of just how much of it is out there, right? It's not 10,000, like they keep saying, it's not 10,000 new cases in a day. It's our metal detector has, you know, gone 10,000 times today. That metal was already out there on the beach. All right. It wasn't being deposited or spontaneously created when the metal detector went off. All right. So if, if, if what I'm saying here is confusing, just go back one or two episodes because we use this analogy to illustrate the difference between someone saying that there's 10,000 new cases of coronavirus today in the sense that there have been 10,000 infections today versus we have discovered that there are 10,000 infections, right? There's a difference and the distinction makes a difference. But the media reports it a certain way because they have certain purposes. And that is what we are on about this morning. The Economist further explained, COVID-19 takes 20 to 25 days to kill victims. The Silverman Washburn paper reckons that 7 million Americans were infected from March 8th to 14th. And official data show that 7,000 deaths Official data show 7,000 deaths three weeks later. The resultant fatality rate is 0.1%, similar to that of the flu. Have I said yet that I've been saying that? No, I haven't been saying. I'm not like I don't. I didn't know that it was similar to the flu. I, you know, and I'm I'm sort of taking on a certain amount of trust here. Our point since the beginning was this thing cannot be what they're representing it as. Simply in virtue of the way they're talking about it. They're saying contradictory things. And I even like we pointed out a few episodes ago, even people we like, even people who we think do good work, not the corrupt one. I mean, like the, what did this start out with? Tucker Carlson, right? Kind of kind of speaking out of both sides of their mouth on this. And, we, and I get it because you want to play the safe side. You want to be overcautious, not undercautious. But at a certain point, we have to ask. What is this overcautiousness costing us? Because now it's starting to cost a lot. And the more it costs and the more irrational that cost looks in light of the way the numbers are, are, are clearing out here, the more you have to wonder how purposeful was this cost we are paying and how frustrated and angry should we be with the people that have perpetuated it and per- pervaded it. Resulting fatality rate, the article's on, is 0.1%, similar to that of the flu. That is amazingly low, just a tenth of some other estimates. Yep, perhaps it is just wrong, possibly because the death toll has been underreported, right? That, that's, a, you know, being scientific, we got to allow for the possibilities, right? That's possible. Perhaps, though, New York's hospitals are overflowing because the virus is so contagious that it has crammed the equivalent of a year's worth of flu cases into one week. The article goes on. The death rate could be higher given that people with asymptomatic or mild coronavirus likely failed to report on non-influenza-like illnesses to their doctors. Uh... That's a very confusing sentence. And I think what the author intends here is that it's possible that a moment ago we sort of jokingly said we know when people die, so we don't got to worry about that number changing. I think what the author is suggesting here, I think what the author is suggesting here is that the death rate could be slightly higher because it could be the case that people are dying of coronavirus having not had reported anything like coronavirus and therefore the death didn't get chalked up to coronavirus, but that is not 
huge consideration here. And it's not going to change the numbers all that much. Anyway, this is this is turning into one long I told you so, but I mean I told you so. Why are they doing this? Why do they do this continually? Um I want to talk to you about the science writer setup. Okay? And I want to give you a couple broad broad thoughts to begin with. All right? If you want to uh what did that guy who was president before Trump say? If you want to fundamentally alter a society, if you want to fundamentally alter a country, you have to fundamentally alter the society within it. If you want to fundamentally alter a society, then you need to um, fundamentally alter what that society thinks of itself. I mean, if you're not going to do it with guns and stuff, right? If you want to fundamentally alter what a society thinks of itself, then you need to fundamentally alter what each individual within the society thinks of themselves. And if you want to fundamentally alter what an individual thinks of themselves, then the thing about them that you're trying to alter their thinking about has to be their defining characteristic. And by there, I mean there as a person, like the thing that makes their personhood what it is. You got to change that if you want to fundamentally alter the person and in virtue of fundamentally altering the person, thereby fundamentally alter the society. You get it? You got to go to the quick. You got to go to the root. If you want to change society, you got to change people. To change free people, you have to change their self-conception. But not about like, not their self-conception about like whether they like bananas or not. That's that's a contingent fact about them. You got to change their conception about their nature. All right. And what is the nature of a person? The nature of a person is that they have a mind. Okay. So you have to change what people think about the origin and purpose and function of their mind. Okay? I know this sounds a little bit abstract. I'm giving you broad strokes here because I want to talk to you about what the role or the occupation or what we've called a few episodes back the 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 the, the role the 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 type, I guess you could call it, what the science writer in our culture is designed to do. Okay, because if you're going to do this, you got to do it in a way that doesn't look like you have ulterior motives. All right, you have to do it from a, a position of presumed or putative neutrality. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Science is the ultimate tool for that purpose. And I don't mean science itself, but the use and mention and and alliance with science. All right? If you get people believing that this new conception of themselves that you want to have them understand is the new true conception, and therefore we need to make these alterations to society in virtue of that. If you want to make them believe that, then you just got to make them believe that it's scientific to believe that. Why? Because science is set up as the one, if only, source of knowledge in our world, in our culture, in our society. That is what? That is what? Not biased. Right? Right? Of course we're non-political. The real power always is. I don't believe you can do that said Mark. Not with the papers that are read by educated people. Well, that shows you're still in the nursery, lovey, said Miss Hardcastle. Haven't you yet realized that it's the other way round? How do you mean? Why, you fool. It's the educated reader who can be gulled. All our difficulty comes with the others. When did you meet a workman who believes the papers? He takes it for granted that they're all propaganda and skips the leading articles. 
He buys his paper for the football results and the little paragraphs about girls falling out of windows and corpses found in Mayfair flats. He is our problem. We have to recondition him. But the educated public, the people who read the highbrow weeklies, don't need reconditioning. They're all right already. They'll believe anything. As one <laughs> of the class you mentioned, said Mark with a smile, I just don't believe it. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, actually, you know what? It's a little bit later in the morning uh, than I had planned to be at this point, and I still got to go run um, before the kids get up. So, I'm going to postpone the elucidation of the science writer setup, which is what I've been building towards here. I'm going to postpone it till next episode. Okay, so we'll start right in on that next time. I want to talk to you at length with some example um, about what the science writer, the science popularizer, is trying to do in our culture. Okay? Okay. I'll see you next time. It's 40 on Semlog Podcast. My name is Nick. All right. Well, you know what? Since Tucker brought us into this whole thing, a month ago, I might add. I'll let Tucker take us out. You know, like I said, this has kind of been one long I told you so, and I sort of started this whole thing I was on literally a month ago about this death rate, about this mortality rate, about this fatality rate, whatever you want to call it, of coronavirus. I started it a month ago, and I use I sort of use Tucker as a foil. I love Tucker. I think he's fantastic. Um, and I was even sort of hesitant to, like, kind of lay the charge at his feet that I was laying, but whatever. Um, it was his segment that sort of prompted me to do this bit and to look into this death rate thing. And so I'll just let Tucker close us out here since this is probably going to be the last of the, I told you so's here's Tucker. Here's Tucker two days ago. Cause now he's caught on. All right. Now that the Stanford scientists have agreed with the 40 on Hemlock podcast, Tucker's on board. All right. One of the scariest things about the Wuhan coronavirus, one of the many reasons all of us have long been so afraid of it, has always been how little we know about it. Ebola, malaria, cholera, obviously those are dangerous diseases. They've killed millions. But on the whole, we understand them pretty well, the fundamentals anyway. anyway. We know how easily they spread. We know how deadly they are. This disease, by contrast, is entirely new. It's literally a novel coronavirus. Early accounts said the mystery illness coming from central China could be transmitted far more easily than the flu and that the death rate was remarkably high. Some reports suggested it could kill two, three, five, even eight percent of all those who got it. Mm. Worst case scenario is predicted millions and millions of people would die. The public was horrified. You kind of participated in that, Tucker. How afraid should they be? Many people are still dying in this pandemic, including here in the United States. Beyond that fact, we still don't have the numbers we need to fully understand what's happening. But we got some. People have been tested. And yet, as of tonight, there are some suggestions of good news we want to bring. Not as of tonight, as of a month ago. On the 22nd and April 4th, a total of 215 pregnant women delivered babies at New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital and Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Every single one of these women was screened for the coronavirus. It turned out that 33 of them had it. That's more than 15% of the total group. Of the infected, 29 of them, that's about 88% of them, were totally asymptomatic. Yep. So think about what that might mean if we extrapolated it. We've wide. been thinking about it. All right. <laughs> New York had more than 60,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus and a little over 2,200 deaths. If more than 15% of New York's population was infected, that would suggest a total of 1.3 million cases in New York, with only about 150,000 of them showing symptoms. In other words, Again, the virus would be yeah. far more widespread than we expected <gasps> it to be, but also far less deadly than we expected. And that's what we've been saying, Tucker. Incidentally, notice he said 15% tested positive, they were asymptomatic. That does not still get at this gargantuan consideration that we heard from the Chicago nurse that 30 to 50% got the antibodies because that is another piece of the pie that radically alters the death rate. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to engage at length in this I told you so shtick. It's a little bit fun. You know, if you were me, you would be too. It just Trust me. I mean, you know, you're trying to get a thing off the ground here, trying to do a little podcast out of your basement. You say something on a hunch a month ago, and then Stanford says it, and then Fox News says it a month later, and you're kind of like, yeah, right? That's all I want to say. I've been saying that I've been saying. 
And I'm going to leave Tucker alone now because he's a way smarter dude than I am. And I like him, and I like his show, and I like his analysis. And we hope you like our analysis here at the 40 on Sam Lock podcast. If so, we, well, whatever. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Or I guess I just say if not, well, whatever.